There we are. I think we're live. Good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us and, and welcome to the next installment of our Think Brick Australia Architecture webinar series. Um, I think everyone's slowly starting to join the room at the moment. So I'll give everyone a couple of moments to get settled, uh, get, your, get your audio working, get your screen working. Um, if, if everyone can hear me all okay, uh, if you'd just like to maybe message in the chat and, and check that everything's working all good and, and say hello, love to love to have a bit of a chat with you all. And um, as we're sort of all doing that, we'll give everyone a bit of a chance to to just join in as well. Lovely to hear, Barrett. Thank you. That's that's a good sign. That means I've managed to get all of my audio correct on my end, which is always good for a Wednesday morning. Good morning, David. How's it going? That's that's two, so I'm I'm feeling pretty confident now. Lesna and Christy, welcome. Thanks for joining. Um, so look, just just before I start, I'll I'll start in the next couple of moments. But look, just a little bit of housekeeping, everyone. Um, if you want to enlarge the slides to make them a little bit bigger for yourselves to see the content, um, you can actually pop out the chat window by pressing the, the little uh, square with the arrow in the top right corner, and that'll just allow you to see the slides um, a little bit clearer. And what I'll do is I'll probably uh, hide my camera a little bit throughout my presentation um, so that you can actually see them even larger than that. So look, what I might do then is um, if that's all well and good, um, you'll obviously notice that it's just me on the stage at the moment here. Um, we do actually also have Manning McBride, um, an architect from McBride, Charles Ryan, who's also going to be presenting on their uh, Penley Essendon Grammar School Music Centre. So uh, a fantastic project that was a high commendation in our Think Brick Awards this year. So make sure you stick through uh, my somewhat dry section because Manning's got all of the really interesting content that I'm sure you've um, all come to see. So look, that being said, everyone, um, welcome to episode five on colours, curves and context. Uh, my name's Jack. I'm the engineering team lead here at Think Brick Australia. And look, before we start, um, I'd just like to acknowledge, obviously, this is a webinar format. So I want to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands from which all of our attendees are joining us today. Um, and I'd like to pay respects to elders past, present and emerging uh, for those lands on which we're all joined today. So look, just a little quick bit about what Think Brick Australia is for anyone that's just joining in or, or having their first webinar. Um, we essentially make it easier to build in brick, block and pavers. So we want to do that by facilitating important conversations, developing talent in the industry and promoting our members' products. And it's through webinars and events like this that we can actually be able to you know, promote these products and, and showcase some of the amazing work that's being used in the masonry scene. How's it going, Gary? Good morning. Thanks for joining. <laughs> uh, and look, just a little bit about our key strategy in a little bit more detail. Um, you know, we've got our Think Brick, uh, Think Brick Awards, and that really, I think, is probably the focus on today's webinar, where we actually look at, you know, showcasing these wonderful products and, and seeing how masonry is actually evolving, uh, particularly in the Australian scene in the 21st century. So look, if, if you are wondering what why Think Brick and, and what we sort of have to offer, the best thing that I can sort of say to you is if you have any questions ever about a brick or block project um, that you sort of you know, need answered or need some information on, whether it's design related or whether it's technical related, um, that's what our team's here for. We offer free manuals, uh, free advice, uh, free case studies. And again, we do events like this that you can all sit in on. And just, you know, get that little bit of tidbit information to keep your week going um, on Brickwork. And again, I'd encourage you all to follow us on our social media. Um, it's a little bit more interesting than myself. We post some really great stuff on Instagram and we have a podcast. Um, and, you know, even speaking today, we have Manning McBride from McBride Charles Ryan. We actually have a podcast with um, Debbie Ryan from MCR as well. So. Um, just little bits of information that we put out there that are just really great and, and bite-sized for you to all, you know, digest throughout your professional lives. Look, just a little bit, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't actually give a bit of a shout out to the members that we represent here at Think Brick Australia. Um, these are the wonderful manufacturers that make it all happen. 
Um, it's, it's all well and good for me to sit here in, in my office and sort of present to you on this content. Um, but it's all, it's all these guys who really, you know, get into the nitty gritty of supplying some really great products, um, you know, unique, custom, bespoke products um, for whatever project you really need. And I, I can see that in the chat box today, I've got some of our members here from, um, you know, PGH and, and Austral Bricks, um, even some people from Leviat. So thank you all for joining and um, we appreciate the support from all of you. So look, just quickly before I really dive into this, what should you get out of this series? If you're an engineer, an architect, a sales rep, someone who's just passionate about bricks, we want you to just gain a better understanding of masonry and, and how you can apply masonry to different projects and give you some inspiration for your future work. So you can actually see that bricks can really be used in whatever application you see fit. So, Look, just a little bit about what we're going to go through today. And again, uh, I'd like to preface that I'm going to try and get through my content relatively quickly because the big ticket item of today's webinar um, that I'm also really excited about is our case study from um, Manny McBride on the Penley Essendon uh, School Music House. So I'm going to talk a little bit today about uh, colours and we're going to talk a little bit about brick curves. And again, finishing up my section with a little bit on, you know, context and, and how to sort of contextualize your projects. And then we're going to delve into that case study and I'm going to switch over to Manning. So firstly, brick colors. Now it's obviously no secret and you'd all be aware that bricks can more or less come in any color variety that you want. And this, you know, we all tend to think about bricks as, you know, your 1970s red brick that was ever popular um, in the sort of Australia during those periods. But look, we're really starting to see now, especially with, you know, through our Think Brick Awards, all of these new projects coming through where we're seeing a range of colours being utilised with masonry. And you can see some great examples today on the screen in front of you. Um, and you can just sort of see the showcase of colors here and the sort of effects that you can create with these. You know, we've got some contrast between the black and white Austral bricks there at the duplex at Little Bay, um, all the way through to something bright green, such as that Helensvale Branch Library that you can see in the bottom left. And again, it's at this point that I'd note to you all that, you know, it's not just color, it's texture as well that you can really change to get a specific look for your build. Um, and you can sort of see even down in the bottom right there with some Kraus Bricks um, Divided House, which was our, our winner from last year's Think Brick Awards, using some really beautiful colours there in combination with some textured brickwork. So look a little bit about how we can actually get our colours and, you know, where we're actually getting these oxides from and how we're making everything happen. So you can sort of see on the screen here, you've got a little bit of a, a cheat sheet or a, a cookbook, um, if you want to call it that, of how our manufacturers can actually go through and create the um, colour compounds for their bricks. So obviously, you know, your reds and your pink bricks have that natural iron oxide component. Um, and then you can actually see here that, you know, depending on what constituents we add into our bricks, we can actually, um, you know, alter our recipe. Um, that's the analogy that I like to use to get different colors. So for example, you can see that um, brown and some of these sort of dark brown and purpley bricks, we might add some manganese um, to give them those colors. And for example, some of those beige colored bricks, we might add some lime, or we might actually reduce the oxygen supply when we're firing the bricks in the kiln um, to get those sort of grays and sort of even verging onto greens um, with regards to the colors that we're getting out. And I mean, I've got some slides here in a, in a, coming up in a little bit, but we've also got the whole world of glazed bricks as well. So, you know, what I want you to all think about is that no matter what project we're sort of doing and what effect we're trying to create with our bricks, chances are if the brick doesn't already exist, the manufacturers can make it exist. They're, um, they're incredible, um, got some beautiful science labs behind them that they love to experiment with. So I'd encourage you all as designers to um, really test them out. And look, just a little quick note, um, obviously it's not all about color. It's also about the actual face style of the brick that you're actually wanting to get. And, and that really does alter the look of your build um, depending on what you're going for. So you can see, you know, in the top, top left and middle left there, you know, you've got your smooth and velour bricks there. 
and that will give you that really nice, chic, clean, modern look to your brickwork. Um, contrast that with, say, you know, your tumbled or your rolled bricks. And if you're trying to create a build that has a more rustic feel to it, once again, you might consider using these products um, in the same sort of full colour range to create those different looks. But look, what I was mentioning about glazed bricks um, is relatively important and it's probably also poignant to today's, um, you know, feature project as well. You can see straight away on the screen here, we've got some incredibly bright and, and striking projects. And, and this is all thanks to the world of glazed bricks. So what essentially happens is we apply that glaze finish during the manufacturing process. And again, we use that sort of analogy of a, of a chef's kitchen. And depending on what color glaze we want, we'll add the different colored pigments or oxides to get those colors. And look, I, I, I always kind of go back to the Springvale Community Hub uh, by Lush, by, sorry, Lions and Rush Ride Associates. Um, you can see they've got all sorts of different colored glaze bricks there. Um, which create almost a sort of mural and a motif that actually represents the um, diversity of the community. It's actually meant to, it's actually meant to be uh, little country flags. That's actually the motif that they're trying to create there with those glazed bricks. So, you know, we all tend to think about bricks as just being a singular construction material, but you can really use colors and glazed bricks to almost create art pieces um, within yourself. And um, if, if anyone's familiar with, I mean, I kind of also go back to this lame analogy of Minecraft, but it's, it's almost like a brick is a pixel and you can really use it to build whatever sort of piece of art or piece of construction that you want. And, and you can see that in those images below. And again, if we're talking about color as well, um, it's really important to think about how mortar affects the look of your wall. Um, little fun fact for everyone, mortar can make up about 15% of your wall. So it's actually a very large percentage of your, of your surface area. And depending on how you treat your mortar colour, that's actually going to drastically affect the look of your wall. And you can actually see that um, with these two projects on the screen at the moment with the Museum State Park using Austral Bricks. They've obviously used a, a light sort of off-white colour to really contrast those red bricks and make them pop out. And you can actually see that contrasted with a dark mortar colour um, with the Monash Peninsula and Recreation Centre. So again, that, that sort of dark mortar creates that depth and creates those shadows, and that can dramatically change the look of your wall. So it's really worth thinking about how you can manipulate not only the brick itself, I mean, you know, obviously we can change the colours for those, but also the mortar colour and how, how that might affect the look of our wall. And you can actually sort of see some examples of that contrasting mortar that I was talking about. Um, some examples even from a high commendation in our new entrant category, um, the Pasco Vale Primary School, using those beautiful red bricks from um, barrel, barrel Bricks, the Capital Reds, and contrasting that with that sort of off-white grey mortar colour, um, even to something like the picture in the bottom left that you can see where they've actually used white bricks um, from Austral Bricks, and they've actually contrasted that with a dark mortar um, to create a really different look. So um, even, you know, when you're doing your drawings and doing your mock-ups, just having a bit of a play around with how it looks with different mortar colours um, is always exciting and it can always change the look of your build. And you can see some examples here converse to the other ones where the architects and the designers have actually tried to colour match the mortar. Um, again, from this year's awards, the um, St Thomas Aquinas Centre by Dikey Richards, They've actually colour matched different sets of mortar to create this mural. So you can see on the left hand side of that image, you've got those sort of uh, off red bricks and they've colour matched that with a sort of red mortar. And then you've actually got those lighter coloured, you know, almost sandstony bricks. And they've actually used a light coloured mortar to match up with those as well, which can create this really nice mural. And that's exactly what they've actually done there with the side of their wall. So they've taken that idea of, you know, pixelation art and they've really emphasised it by colour matching the mortar for that project. And last but not least as well, um, you can also look at painting your mortar as well. So this is the, this is another Dikey Richard project. They're, um, they're big fans of manipulating their mortar, so to speak. 
And you can actually see here that they've painted the mortar black to, uh, to match the actual black painted bricks to create that sort of horizontal band of black brickwork in amongst those yellows. So if you look at that photo on the right hand side, you can actually see a direct contrast between the light colored mortar on the bottom and the top of the wall and that sort of dark painted over black mortar. And you can instantly see the effect and the change that that creates for your wall. And again, you can sort of see here, this is another favorite of mine, um, is the Achuca Twin Rivers School, where they've actually used barrel bricks to actually create this motif um, of one of the native birds in the area. So they've actually sort of, you can see the bird on the right hand side you can see how that sort of translates um, to a piece of really specific local art um, that can be enjoyed by everyone at the school. So uh, just nifty solutions to really integrate context into your build. So look, now I think it's time to really talk about curved walls and how we sort of get into designing these. And you can see on the, on the sort of screen here, we've got some fantastic examples. Um, that have all been favourites in our awards over the years. I think the, the three projects on the middle and right actually won the commercial category in all of their respective years. Um, and you can sort of see the striking effect that it creates. We all like to think of bricks as quite a um, rectilinear unit and very, very sort of rectangular. Um, but using them to create curved walls is a really good way of actually showcasing the potential as well as the modular nature of, of masonry. So in terms of some structural considerations, it's obviously worth noting that curved walls do actually fall within the scope of AS 3700. So, you know, if we're talking about construction standards um, and, and, you know, getting your engineers involved, um, it's worth noting that you can design these walls using some of the principles in AS 3700. You know, curved walls are generally used for their structural as well as aesthetic benefits. You know, for instance, in comparison to a straight wall, curved walls exhibit added stability um, and resistance to out of plane loading compared to a straight wall due to the sort of increased moment of inertia that you get. So, you know, if you can imagine having that sort of curve and, you know, exhibiting that load onto the wall and seeing how that would actually perform, you've got that added support from each of your end cases or, you know, the, each end of your curved wall. And, you know, I'm not going to delve too much into the structural considerations here because it's a Wednesday morning and I'm, I'm conscious that um, I don't want to sound too much like an engineer here. But um, we've got a really great fact sheet that actually discusses some of these specific engineering considerations and manipulations you might use um, when considering a curved wall in your build. Um, as, a, as a general rule of thumb as well, if the radius produced by the curve is greater than or equal than twice the length of the actual curved arc, you can actually assess it as if it were a typical straight wall. Um, you can see that diagram on the screen here kind of showcases how it actually translates uh, from a, to a graphical perspective. So you can actually really play around and manipulate your curves to make your life easier from, a, from an engineering and, and design perspective. Next thing that's worth talking about with regards to curves is your actual bond patterns. So you can obviously imagine that the, the way you orient the bricks is going to affect how tight your curve is. And you can actually see here that, you know, depending on whether you use a, a header, so, you know, exposing your small face of your brick or a, a stretcher or a soldier face, you can achieve much tighter curves. So, you know, this is a, a, a gallery project um, that used some of those Austral bricks and you can actually see different orientations of soldier, uh, header, as well as stretcher in the background of that photo and see the, the tightness of the curves they're able to achieve. And you can often manipulate your actual mortar joints. So you can, you know, close your mortar joints on the inside side of your curve and you can expand your mortar joints out to actually help create that curve. So as a general rule of thumb, if you're trying to create a really nice tight curve, uh, it's best to use a header bond where you can sort of see in the middle, in the middle right hand side of the screen there. And that allows you to get that really nice tight curvature. Uh, and if you are looking for a, a much wider curve with a larger radius, let's say four to six meters, you can actually use a stretcher bond and, and comfortably be able to achieve that curve 
Um, and I'm sure that Manning can, can likely speak to that with regards to the case study that we've got coming up. One other thing that's really worth pointing out if we're talking about curved walls as well, and, and this really goes back to the, the beauty of our manufacturers that we represent here at ThinkBrick and just some of the really amazing and, and frankly cool things that they can do, is that you can actually use curved bricks, which is a really nice, simple way of assisting you in creating a curved piece of masonry. Um, a really great example of this is a project that's garnered a lot of attention, both in our Think Brick Awards, as well as in the wider Australian and international architecture community, um, would be Key Quarter Lanes by Studio Bright, um, using some of those curved austral bricks. So you can actually see here a photo of the construction process um, in the middle of the screen. And you can actually see that for the 1200 millimeter and 600 millimeter curve, they've actually employed some of those custom curved bricks to actually really easily allow them to create that curve um, on the building. And it saves having to break up the orientation of your units. You know, it saves you having to go from a stretcher bond to a header bond to achieve that tight curve. So just a really novel way to um, use bricks to create something that, you know, we might not expect to see with masonry. And look at just another really great example of how we can manipulate bricks as well to create really intricate shapes um, is Tiger Prawn from Wow 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 Architects, which actually used a squint brick. And you can see in a, a photo up in the top, top of the screen there, where you've actually got the brick having a angular section cut off. And this allows you to really easily manipulate that brick to create either tight curves or tight angular pieces to your masonry. And you can actually see um, down in the bottom right hand side, they actually used uh, bricks with their header course to create some of those almost drapery curves around the build. So just some really great projects to get you inspired and thinking about how you can use bricks in a really great manner in a, in a really sort of novel way. Now I've got one final slide to sort of throw here before I actually um, pass over to Manning so he can talk about some of the really exciting and interesting content of today. Um, but look, that would be to do with context and look, just considering where bricks might be the most appropriate and, and where they might have a bit of an upper hand on competitor materials. Um, and I like to use, you know, these two examples. Uh, a personal favourite from mine is The Seagrass House by Welsh and Major, which was a high commendation in our, our awards this year. Um, this is a location on the south coast of New South Wales, which is actually where I'm from. So I'm quite familiar with the, the context of the area and um, the sort of local surroundings. And as you can see, this is a, a heavily forested area with, with native vegetation. Um, and it's actually quite bushfire prone. This is located in the community of Tarthra, which has actually been subject to bushfires previously. And so the natural material choice for this build and part of the reason why bricks were selected was because of the sort of non-combustible material properties of bricks. They respond very well in a, in a bushfire environment. Um, as you can imagine, bricks are fired at over a thousand degrees for a day or two, sometimes longer. Um, so obviously this inherently makes them non-combustible and it makes them a great material choice when you're looking at doing resilient building um, in the Australian bush. And look, finally, another one that's really great as well is the Furback Granite Learning Centre. So this is actually an extension of a 1970s red brick building. So again, they've chosen to actually really sort of hone in on that and use the red brick to sort of celebrate the heritage and the history of the campus um, and, and showcase, you know, how bricks can translate from the 1970s through to the 21st century in a, in a really nice tidy manner. So as you can sort of see, this is a really nice introduction and a bit of an interlude into what Manning's going to speak about today. So um, I'm going to pass over to him now and he's going to join me on stage um, and he's going to go through the wonderful Music House project at Pegs. And we've got a surprise Debbie Ryan with him as well. Welcome Debbie. <laughs> Oh, well, well, thanks. Look, I'm gonna I'm gonna disappear off stage, and I'm gonna hand over to you. Thank you both. Cool. Thanks. Thanks very much, Jack. Yeah. So Deb's just joined. I'll be presenting um, about the music house, and Deb will be here to answer any questions if anyone has as well. Um, thanks for everyone for joining. 
um, and thanks to Tink Brick for putting on this webinar. I'd also like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of, of the land in which we meet um, and their deep history of spatial practice, in particular the Wurundjeri people who are the traditional owners of the, an, of the land of our office here in Paran, but also of um, the land in Essendon in which this project is. Um, so I'll be presenting just a little kind of encapsulation of the concept of this project, but then also just giving you a bit of a behind the scenes of, of how we reached that um, final kind of design resolution, how the design evolved over time, um, and then perhaps some of the challenges that we encountered during documentation and construction um, that were resolved. Um, okay. Uh, so first, starting off with the concept. Um, so the brief was pretty simple for this project. It was the refurbishment of an existing Victorian house um, to reach sort of modern teaching standards um, with a series of music tuition rooms, so individual all the way up to small um, ensembles. And then uh, the addition, which is a large component of the project, which had additional support services, um, a large classroom that could also double as a performance space. A central gesture underpinning the project um, is the line of a frozen sound wave. Um, and this line is superimposed on that northern facade of the addition um, to provide openings for light, ventilation, um, and demarcate the points of entry. Um, the context of the project, so a, a kind of distinct character of this um, junior boys school campus for Penley and Essendon Grammar School is that it sits within this suburban block. Um, and from the outside, um, it's not really clear where the school starts or ends. They've kind of um, colonized a lot of these suburban residences. Um, and then you can see the music house is just there in the darker gray. And it sits alongside this building on the right, which was completed by MCR in 2009. Um, and this bro project was um, a learning center for year five and six um, junior boys. Um, and it attempted to play with um, the child's imagination. So it has this kind of abstracted silhouette of a Federation home. Um, but then the interior is um, this kind of cloud-like curvilinear interior. Um, so playing with the ideas of perception, um, and a bit of fun as well. And this project kind of follows suit. So that house on the left is the Victorian house in which um, this project resides. Um, and here's just an aerial view of, of the site. So on the right hand side is that Victorian house and then the playground, which I'll mention a little bit further, further on, um, which was a kind of uh, constraint of the pro site, I suppose. Um, but yeah, that was before we completed the project. So a little bit of a background of the design evolution, um, the, you know, how we present this project on our website and, and, and awards and things is usually this kind of neat packaged concept. Um, but our design process, um, isn't so neat and we kind of take the client on the journey with us, um, to reach that kind of end idea. Um, the brief from the client was pretty simple. Um, they have, they kind of joke with us, um, to say like, you know, we didn't ask for a building with, um, that's, you know, about a frozen sound wave. They just give us this brief that says, you know, we want a classroom space. We want a few shelves, um, to store music equipment. Um, but they also do really enjoy working with us and they enjoy us entertaining them along the way, I suppose, as well. Here's just a little um, uh, snippet of some of the kind of design evolution that took place. Um, so one of the key constraints that was identified early on in the project was that playground. Um, and, we, and the building, the extension to the music house actually had to achieve a specific uh, distance radius from the playground equipment. Um, so here you can see us playing with a few different ways to arrange this spatially, um, you know, perhaps a big radius in the center there, or um, the more sort of fluid form that we arrived at on the right-hand side. Um, 
and then here's just a three-dimensional um, snippet of these. Um, I suppose in this early stage, we kind of just play with a range of ideas and, and bring in references and then kind of see what sticks or see what um, the client likes. Um, and then obviously choosing that fluid option, we proceeded with that. Um, and then here's, you know, that, that was the kind of spatial arrangement that we agreed upon. And then we started to develop, how does this look like in elevation in three dimensions? Um, so experimenting with how to resolve, how to provide openings to the classroom spaces. Um, and then that's where we arrived on that idea in the, in the bottom right hand corner of this um, frozen sound wave that links back to the purpose of the building, which is a music facility. Um, and here's the final plan of the project. So you can see the kind of distinction between the existing Victorian house um, in the dark hatch. Um, and then the extension on the left-hand side. Um, a core component is the kind of circulation that is the, the central spine, I suppose, of the project um, that runs from the front door of the Victorian house through to that classroom or performance space. Um, and in the Victorian house, it's, it's mainly made up of um, individual music tuition rooms. Um, a couple of them are a bit bigger um, for small ensembles. Um, and then some of them have a bit more acoustic um, treatment um, for the percussion room, for example. Um, and then most of the services are contained um, in the center between the, the classroom um, and the Victorian house. Uh, there's bathrooms, um, staff amenities and storage facilities. Um, and then here's just a look at the elevation from the west. Um, so although this um, the project is quite expressive and um, distinct from a lot of the buildings on the campus, it actually has its origins in a kind of, um, I suppose, typical modernist school building, which is a brick building with a skillion roof. Um, so that's uh, in a kind of abstract way, a kind of reference to um, some of the other buildings on campus. Um, and then, of course, um, colour. So once we sort of decide upon uh, the, the spatial arrangement, the gesture of the project, um, we start to engage with how do we reach this in a more detailed material resolution. Um, experimenting with, you know, cream brick, which links back to that Victorian house, which has a bit of cream brick in it, um, or um, really embodying the, the like or um, embracing the distinction between the, the extension and the original house um, and introducing some color um, and I think it was this point um, where I think reached the time with the client where um, things had started to chug along but um, they really like us sort of engaging them and entertaining them along the way and I think that idea of the frozen sound wave was was nice, but I think it reached the point in the project where they wanted a little bit more. So we started looking at some references for brick, and this is the Kolta Minor Minaret in Uzbekistan. Um, and, you know, when they were kind of, they seemed like they wanted some entertainment, we, we brought this story along of this minaret, which is an, actually an unfinished minaret, uh, which was commissioned by a sultan at the time. Um, and then that architect who designed this minaret was um, was commissioned by another sultan to complete a project for them. Um, and then they started that project and then the sultan had the architect executed um, for essentially betraying him. Um, and uh, when once we told this story to the client, there was this kind of stillness and silence that kind of fell upon the room. Um, and then it wasn't, it was one of the more mischievous uh, team members of the client group who just said, don't worry, we'll finish the project. <laughs> so it's a nice little story behind our engagement with them. Um, and here's the, the buildings sitting together uh, upon completion. Um, so they have this kind of dialogue. Um, the Federation home, uh, the silhouette of the Federation home, which kind of abstracts it and strips out any of that detailing. Our extension kind of brings back some of that Federation detailing. You can see with the timber battens and the arches. 
Um, and then uh, I suppose moving on to a little bit of a section on sustainability. So sustainability was a big focus of this project. Obviously, when we received um, the brief, uh, the condition of the existing house was pretty dilapidated. So a core component is just essentially to extend the life of that building to update it for, for modern teaching standards, um, for thermal comfort um, and other. Um, here's a shot during construction. So a lot of um, the finishes and walls were pretty dilapidated and in a poor state. Um, so a big component was refurbishing them. Um, and then there was also a lot of rising damp and water problems. So we to take, top, take stock of um, every single room, every single wall and note where we um, expect where we could visibly see some water damage and that hard plaster had to be replaced by the contractor. But essentially trying to keep the bit, the bones of um, the Victorian house, um, the floor. So this is uh, this section of the Victorian house actually has a slab, but um, other sections, um, the stump subfloor were rotten. So we had to completely replace all the, the flooring, um, obviously new carpet, um, new finishes, etc., and then new windows as well. So uh, replacing all um, the existing windows with double glazed and double hung windows to not only improve um, the thermal performance of the building, but also improve the acoustic qualities. Obviously, you can imagine a lot of um, music, individual music tuition going on um, at once. Um, so acoustic protection between the, the rooms was a key consideration. And then here you can see the finished product. So um, where possible, uh, we tried to kind of celebrate the layers of history that existed within this um, Victorian house. Um, so on the left, obviously replacing the carpet, um, similar kind of color and finish um, to as uh, during the period. And then on the left there, you can see the, the timber flat fireplace that was stained timber that had been refurbished for this project. So something original. Um, also on the left there is those Art Deco doors. Um, so we actually, again, got them refurbished, increased um, the thickness of the glazing to inc uh, improve the acoustic performance. Um, and then obviously the beautiful ornamental ceiling, which is original. Um, and then some new elements that we've introduced, which is the color, um, the doors, and this new wall that opens up that central spine of circulation. And then also installing up lighting um, that lights up and illuminates that beautiful ornamental ceiling. So you can see the layers of history, um, but it's, it's very much a functional refurbishment to upgrade this for modern teaching standards. And here's another shot of that where you can see the fireplace. Um, you can also see some of the joinery that was introduced. Um, this joinery uh, is obviously just for storage in these music tuition rooms, but it kind of recedes into the background. It's in this uh, lime washed Victorian ash finish. So let, really letting the um, stained timber uh, shine, I suppose. Um, and then a little note about the Art Deco doors. Um, that door on the right was actually in the opening there on the left. So there was a double door there, but we didn't see that as uh, necessary given this kind of fluid circulation that we, we were trying to achieve. Um, so we actually took those doors off the position on the left, had them refurbished and actually had them widened a little bit um, to fit the openings and other areas um, on the right. So wherever possible, reusing um, and then not only do we have water damage coming from the ground, so rising damp, but we also had some, some leaks coming from the roof. Um, so a significant portion um, of the refurbishment was to replace um, the color bond roofing of the veranda and also the slate um, tiles um, of the Victorian house. Um, and then uh, I suppose the additional thing to that was um, a central uh, HVAC system. So each music tuition room has its own split system um, and the windows are openable. So 
teachers, staff members can monitor um, the temperature of their own room individually. Um, and then it's all controlled by a central uh, system. So um, a little bit of the kind of design development, some of the construction challenges. Um, this is a drawing from one of our engineers, uh, the structural engineer. So it's a pretty basic um, floor structure sitting on piles due to the um, soil conditions. Um, and then it's basically just a raft slab with um, con concrete beams between the piles um, and about a 200 slab um, between the beams. And then the framing. So majority of the project um, is pretty standard uh, post and beam structure with a lightweight roof, um, with the exception of this northern facade, which is kind of the moment um, of the project. Um, and it has an actual three-dimensional truss um, to hold up that facade, uh, which is probably best exhibited by this drawing from our engineers, Drew Rudd engineers. Um, but you can see the red members, which are the primary um, columns. Um, and then there's that, that truss that runs along the top, uh, which spans between them. And then that essentially is supporting um, each of those archways and the steel plate shown in the blue. Um, and then I, I suppose another thing is just to the, the kind of hierarchy or prioritization of budget in this project. Um, so obviously the rest of the building is pretty standard um, materials. And then this is where a lot of the budget was spent to try to um, maximize that um, connection to the 2009 project, but also connection to the wider campus. Um, and here's a shot of that structure um, during construction. So a little bit messy. Um, but you can see those steel members. And I think it was a bit of a shame. Uh, we often find in our projects, it's sometimes a bit of a shame to cover up the structure because um, it's quite beautiful in its own right. Um, here's some of the documentation of how we deal with these, um, these archways or the geometry. So obviously in this flat elevation, it looks like pretty simple geometry, right? So um, it only has a, a couple of different radiuses. Um, for this rolled steel plate. Um, but obviously when you superimpose that upon uh, an undulating plan, um, you get a double curve. So how to fabricate those pieces of steel plate becomes um, an issue or I suppose a challenge for the project, um, not only for the contractor, but for us communicating to the contractor. So here's a little snapshot of how we documented these steel plates so the contractor could accurately quote, you know, what they needed to. So on the left and the bottom there, you can see each um, radius is divided up into a piece, A, B, C, D, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then these pieces um, are laid out on the right where they're unrolled um, and they uh, unrolled into a kind of 2D template that, can, that was then laser cut um, and then rolled into that and then eventually welded on site. Um, so you can see here, that's how those um, steel plate were uh, fabricated and brought to the site. And then uh, a picture here, you can see some of those weld joints um, between the plate. Um, and then another note, I suppose, those timber battens holding up um, these secondary arches. Um, so I think every fourth um, dropper was a steel reinforced dropper to help support the weight of um, the bottom arches. Uh, and then these were essentially just cl uh, clad with timber battens. Um, and then you can see the little holes uh, for the bolts that were put through there. Um, and then here's um, some shots of uh, the project further developed. You can see some of the internal framing that's starting to come in to frame those archways. Um, and then some little uh, patch plates for the glazing coming in. Um, and then I suppose the next challenge for us um, was how to support the brick wall. Um, sorry, I'll just go back. So with this project, I think, you know, 
Um, often with our engineers, we'll go back to them and say, you've put in way too much structure. Um, can you strip some out? Um, but our, on this project, uh, the structural engineer came back to us and complained about us trying to put um, bricks on a slippery dip. Um, and there's no, uh, it's definitely caused some headaches on site, I suppose. Um, here's some details of the construction of the brick wall. Um, so basically just a pretty simple brick veneer wall, except instead of um, brick ties to um, what steel or timber studs, um, it was to that 3D truss of the north facade. Um, and then here you can see uh, in the section detail on the left, um, those bricks were actually supported on that steel plate. As I said, the structural engineer complained about us trying to put bricks on a slippery dip. So part of these, um, some sections of these steel plate were actually angling away from the facade. So you can imagine the bricks would, um, it's no, long, no longer providing a kind of horizontal bed for the bricks. So they would have the tendency to slip off. And this was something that wasn't necessarily picked up by the engineers or by us um, in the earlier stages of design, but a challenge that we dealt with during construction. Um, and the solution uh, here is an elevation showing uh, these yellow um, steel angles that were welded onto the steel plate. And they would essentially form a nice horizontal bed uh, for the brick to sit on. And here's a little uh, prototype that we had uh, done on site just to ensure that that was going to work. Um, so that course of bricks just had a, like a little bed and it spanned across to the next um, section of steel angle on the other side. Here's that brick wall starting to get formed up. Um, yeah. And then um, some other details around um, the corners, how do we deal with them? And also this Western facade. Um, it wasn't always um, a kind of a cold architect's instruction, I suppose, dealing with the builders. This is in the midst of lockdown. So this is our director, Rob McBride, um, send, you know, using, I think it was called the chic Jenga blocks um, to try and model up a prototype to communicate more clearly to the, um, to the builder. So this is the little dog tooth corner um, uh, at the end of that wall. And you can see some sketches here as well. Him, not only Rob trying to figure it out, but communicate to the builder. Um, and then here's um, that in reality. So once the bricklayer um, got that dialogue and they were able to put this together. Um, and then I think, you know, an interesting um, part, I suppose, of this project, I mean, the um, one of the clients, one of the representatives from the client was like, what are we going to do with the back, back, back of those bricks? You know, we're we going to paint them to match the, the color of the front. But, um, you know, we kind of like the idea of exposing the back of the bricks, similar to the idea of the 2009 project, where it's kind of sparking the child's imagination, revealing these like little moments of um, the construction process, perhaps, um, is something, you know, we like the idea of. Um, and then also uh, that Western facade. So we used um, polished concrete block. Um, so obviously not brick, but it's, it's a kind of more basic material. It's obviously got the polished finish, so it's a little bit higher spec. Um, but how do we detail that um, relatively basic or mundane material um, to give it a bit more character, a bit more finesse? So this is um, just a little detail of how that project was put together, again, in the chic, ultra chic Jenga blocks. Um, and then here's a little shot of those um, polished concrete blocks here. And you can see how the light uh, reflects off those and you can really pick up um, that detail. Also a little detail around some of the um, overflow, um, which goes into the rain garden here. Um, just like bending back again, um, introducing these moments of kind of revealing um, what's behind the structure, what's behind the cladding, what's behind the facade. 
and don't be worry, worried those uh, blue bricks were a mistake which got uh, corrected and made black. Um, and then some other details with the bricks. So um, for the stairs leading up on that western facade, um, we just essentially exposed um, the top of those extruded bricks, which gives you um, the sufficient colour contrast for Australian standards. Um, and then one thing to note, if, if anyone wants to do this detail, is that you have to use non-shrink grout um, to fill those holes in the bricks, um, just to ensure that they don't shrink and become big gaps over time. And then just a little recap on uh, the fi finished product, I suppose. So um, here's a nice shot in the distance of um, the two buildings that we've completed on this campus. Um, they form this kind of nice little ensemble, I suppose. Um, they contrast in varying ways, but they have a kind of similar engagement with ideas and imagination. And then if you remember the playground at the start, which was um, a huge driver of the spatial arrangement, I suppose. Uh, once the building was finished, the client actually said, you know what, we don't want that playground anymore. It kind of ruins the building. So they took it away, um, which is interesting because it was a huge driver for the project. But now it forms this um, beautiful little kind of courtyard between the two buildings. Um, and I think um, much to their surprise, they've seen some boys um, sitting and eating their lunch um, under this tree uh, when they usually might be um, running around on the playground. Um, and then the southern facade, we obviously didn't mention much about that, but again, that's brick veneer. Um, the geometry from the northern facade is carried through to the south, but it's abstracted into this kind of 2D pattern. Um, and then um, obviously this backs onto a, a sort of play area or sports field. So um, having that kind of robust but also flat surface for kids to bounce their balls off was a, um, a bit of a part of the project. Um, and then some just nice detailed shots of it in full resolution. Um, and then the relationship with the existing Victorian house, you can see some of the um, hints that tie them together with the brick patterning, um, um, the veranda space, some of the vertical elements, um, but also they're obviously incredibly distinct. Some moments from the um, Victorian house where single spaces are divided into multiple rooms are carried on through to the other projects. So this um, single space of that uh, round portion of the building um, is divided into two. Oh, and another note on that was um, the timber battens that are included in this room. So it's actually a chevron batten. Um, and that's to mitigate some of the concerns that might come out of a curve, or the acoustic concerns that come out of a curved or circular room. Um, the acoustics for a circular room means that um, the sound bounces back to the single place and it's not ideal acoustically. So uh, having that chevron um, wall cladding bounces it off in multiple directions um, and achieves that kind of better acoustic performance. And then this is that central spine of circulation. Um, it's open, uh, kind of open, enclosed, open but uh, covered uh, veranda space, we like to call it, um, which is something we introduced to the school um, in some of our earlier work and that 2009 project, um, but they really like it. Um, they think it's good to uh, for, for, for the young boys or other students running between classrooms, it's good to get that fresh air um, throughout. And then here's that main performance space. So it's a classroom, but it also doubles as a place for parents to come and see their kids perform. Um, and it's something that uh, the client wanted to be um, beautiful and memorable, which I think we've achieved. And then, uh, Notwithstanding a lot of the headaches that occurred on site, um, I think the builder was pretty chuffed uh, when the project was complete. So obviously in the midst of COVID with our masks on, but I can assure you he's smiling 
underneath. Um, I think we've got a little video um, that we're going to play. I think Jack's going to get that up for us. Hopefully it works. Yeah, and I suppose, you know, these buildings, they don't just come um, from the genius of one individual. Um, it's, you know, many hands that make these projects come together. So a huge thanks to the MCR team who worked on the project, but also um, the engineers, other consultants, um, and the contractor as well. And the photography and the, and the video there by Tim, who also works for our MCR. Thanks, everyone, for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it was... Um, uh, of interest and uh, a little bit of fun. And um, I'll let Jack take it from here. If there's any questions. No worries. I mean, thank you very much, Manning. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie, for coming and joining us as well. I mean, it was, I've had a, I've had obviously had a bit of a look at these slides beforehand. Um, but for me, it's still really interesting to see how this all comes together, particularly some of the, um, the engineering components are really fantastic. Um, we've got some, we've got everyone in the chat saying well done. So I think um, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to put them in. But I do have one in the interim. Um, and I think it's for, for you, Debbie. You know, there's a quote from our Think Brick podcast where I think you say something along the lines of, you know, people would say, I don't think you can do that with bricks um, and it, it might not be possible. Um, you know, and then you sort of said, you know, but that's that's your job to make it happen and to make that magic happen. So I guess my question is, you know, was there a moment where bricks maybe were or weren't going to work? And, and how did you sort of make sure you came to that conclusion to, you know, cause they're obviously one of the standout feature elements here. Um, well, well, I think, you know, we have a lot of experience with pattern and color. So in bricks, so that was never <laughs> an issue. Um, we could work those things out. I mean, those curves were, a bit tricky and we did have to resolve things mm. on site um, in the end you know because you know the bricks slipping off essentially um but look it, it is just the same thing it, you know you you get a challenge and you just have to figure out how to um deal with it and um and you can always deal mm. with it um there might be a slight little movement or whatever but it just um it's resolvable to an extent yeah it does. I just think you just keep on going and you do resolve things. <laughs> it's always a work in progress. Take every day as it comes, right? <laughs> well, that's right. I think, I think that's one of the beautiful things about architecture, actually. Like, it has a lot of challenges, but it's definitely not a boring job. You are faced with a different issue every day. <laughs> and um, I think, you know, that's that's sort of what makes it more interesting. We're not, do we're not doing a repetitive job. No, def definitely not with these projects. <laughs> <laughs> In terms of brick, I mean, um, we've worked with pegs on, I think, six yeah. or seven projects now, and, and glazed brick has become a bit of a kind of identity for a lot of those buildings. So it's it's something that, like, although each of them are very distinct in their own way, um, glazed brick is almost is used in all of them, I think, almost. Um, so that was kind of, it's kind of an important material palette, I suppose, for the school. So it was certainly something we were, we were willing to um to maintain in the project. And to be honest, I'm not even sure, it certainly wasn't when we first started getting our jobs there, but they have come over time to recognise that the buildings that we've put on um, their properties ha uh, sort of have become part of their brand, mm. if you like. Yeah. And, um, and so they, they sort of are acknowledging that. 
I probably should have just slightly corrected Manning about entertaining them because it's not really about just entertaining them. I mean, a key, key to it all has really about, been about extending the imagination of young boys um, and girls, you know, when we've done the girls project. So it's sort of, and I think the other thing is in our architecture, it's always, um, we're always considering the idea of joy, joy in a project, because I think there's not enough joy around these days. And um, it's a really important yeah, thing. Definitely. And I think, I think Peter's also got another question, which is a good question. Um, how did you deal with condensation and install weep holes within the um, curved brick wall of this building? Yeah, so there actually is um, weep holes essentially at the bottom of each arch where um, where you know, the arch kind of touches the ground. Um, and yeah, I suppose the weep hole, and you can imagine at the top of the arches, um, if there is any condensation, it just runs behind in that cavity and runs kind of down to the bottom of the arches. Um, so there are weep holes. They might not be super visible from this distance um but, but if there. you see some of they the other, are there they are there yeah, um, yeah. so yeah we, we couldn't avoid the weep holes but, but uh, they're necessary definitely definitely necessary i mean condensation such a big concern so it's good good to know that it's it's all well and safe <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I'm just I'm conscious of the time we've got so I'm going to just quickly finish the slides but then obviously if anyone has any questions as well please feel free to put them in the chat while I'm finishing up um firstly yeah we'll stick firstly I want to say thank you um to to you Manning for presenting and Debbie for coming um and I guess look just to wrap up if, if everyone has anywhere to be now that it's midday um, please feel free to download our Curve Walls fact sheet and go to our website and check out all of our case studies. Um, they, they touch on some other fantastic projects and they tackle some, you know, different architectural and engineering concerns. Um, and also, you know, just feel free to go along to our, our website as well and, and check out all of our manuals and resources and feel free to get in contact with us, you know. As I like to say, keep the questions coming to our team. Um, keep, you know, if you've got anything that you're not sure about with relation to brick, chances are we'll have something to say about it and we'll put, point you in the right direction. So that, so that you too can be creating some really awesome projects like this one here that we've seen um, with, the, with the Pegs Music Centre. So look, with, with that all um, being said, um, follow, follow us as well as also um, McBride Charles Ryan on, on the Instagram and the LinkedIn platforms. Um, and I want to say thank you to any everyone that does have to disappear now. I think we're going to put up a, a post webinar survey um, in a minute, as well as some associated polls. So feel free to interact with those. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to just flip it back to your final slide, Manning. And then if anyone has any final questions, if you'd like to pop those in the chat, I'm happy to happy to answer those, or happy to get probably Debbie and Manning to answer those. <laughs> and uh, we can go from there. But thank you all for coming. Thank you. And I guess while we're, while we're wrapping up, I do have another question for you just, to keep you, just to keep you here one or two minutes longer while everyone's sort of yeah. deciding whether they, whether they have something else to do right now. <laughs> um, you mentioned that you've used, obviously, the concrete masonry um, in the sort of, you know, you can see it in the front, front facade shot here that you've got on, on the screen right now. Um, and it's, I didn't actually notice that you'd actually offset those in the photos that I'd seen, which is really, really awesome. And it's a good way of elevating a material which we, you know, often associate with car parks, retaining walls. So I guess yeah. my question is, you know, are you going to be looking at using concrete masonry a little bit more in some future projects and, and bringing some elevation to that material as well? Yeah, we have, and, yeah, and to be honest, <laughs> to be honest, the reason, or one of the reasons why we used it on this project was you can actually see it on the left-hand side in that um, building that we completed in 2009. So it's another kind of nod that ties the two mm -hmm. projects together. Um, so it's definitely something we have used a lot in the past, and we we do like the, pro the mm -hmm. product, you know. Yeah, and I think just graphically, it really works in this situation. It just sort of um, as the end piece to that building. Mm. Um, and you yeah, I mean, there's there's also a number of ways you can play with that material as well. Not only like we in these instances, we've used the polished one, um, but you can use it just similar to um, the, the brick face finishes mm. you mentioned at the start. Yeah, um, you can play with the different textures of honed um, or split. I think 
um, finishes. So yeah, definitely um, something we continue to use. It's it's more affordable and and um, can be quite beautiful. Yeah, well, we particularly like the polished mm. one because it does look quite luxurious. Yeah, it's <laughs> nice. Yeah, seeing seeing what some of the architects have come out with in the in the, our most recent couple of years of the Think Brick Awards with the with the polished and the honed like masonry blocks from the manufacturers we represent at, at Concrete Masonry Association. It's it's lovely. Like it's, I think it's a material that's getting a lot more attention for all the right reasons. So it's good good to see that, you know, you're, you're part of setting the trend. So Definitely. Definitely. we always try to be there. <laughs> I mean, look, I mean, you know, MCR has been such big supporters of Brick. You guys have, you know, been around for since, since I was, you know, tiny. So you guys have been doing it really well and i mean elizabeth who's not here today our, our ceo she she absolutely loves the work that mcr does so and i'm, I'm sure all of our manufacturers do as well because it, it keeps them happy keeps it keeps keeps them making it into all these fantastic you know architecture magazines and all of these fantastic awards programs so we're we're more than happy to support you as an industry wherever we can <laughs> thank you well yeah. all right we'll if no one has any questions, thanks very much for giving us the platform, Jack, and everyone at Think Brick. Um, and thanks everyone for joining. No worries. Thanks. Thanks for coming along. Um, and thank yeah, thank you for all your knowledge on this project. It's been it's been a great little webinar. And um, thank you, thank you everyone else for tuning in. So um, I think a copy of this webinar will be sent over to everyone that's attended. So feel free to um, share this around with everyone. And um, that being said, I will I will let you get back to everything that you need to be doing, no doubt, Manning and Debbie, and um, we'll we'll say goodbye to everyone. Thank Bye. you. Thank See you, ya. everyone.